Uh, I'm David Sutton. I'm the mechanical engineer. Uh, they made me the MC because I'm kind of the, the jack of some trades, master of none. Uh, that's what we get in ME. Uh, what I've learned in ME is there's always someone who can do your job better than you. Your job is to talk to those people and don't let them know they're doing your job. <laughs> because they produce both hair and milk. <laughs> Coconuts are a four-chambered heart away from being mammals. <laughs> if a basic girl trips acid, does she get salty? <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so kind of playing off Tommy's joke, uh, how many of you guys asked out the one girl in your math class? Yeah. That's what I expect from you guys. <laughs> How many of you girls came anyway? One, all right. I thought I saw more, I was wrong. Uh, so this next joke is about mansplaining. And it feels weird for me to tell it. So I was wondering if there was someone in the audience who could come and, and help me out with it. Could I get a volunteer? Hopefully from the floor. No volunteers? You, your classes have taught you well. Rebecca, can I pick on you because I know your name? <laughs> Could everyone give it up for Rebecca real quick? <laughs> just, just remember, when you're at the mic, it's like when you're at the board. Your, your, your brain... Oh, wow, that's not going to be anyone. Yeah, that's why. Hence the... Um, yeah, so when you're at the mic, it's like when you're at the board, everything just goes out the window. Mm -hmm. um, so, Rebecca, can you tell us what mansplaining is? Yeah, so mansplaining... That's when someone, well, in my experience, has been who's not in your major, but they don't realize that you're in a STEM major, try to explain things to you that you already know, and they do it wrong, and you're like, were you actually, like, did you take that class? Because that's not how the teacher said it. And then they continue to go on this for a while while you're interjecting, you know, trying to tell them that you actually know things. Yeah, that, that's my experience of mansplaining. Okay, yeah, that's, that's pretty close. Mansplaining is actually... so I quit that team immediately. <laughs> First of all, because seniorosis has me real hard, and I, it's a good day if I can give more than 50%. <laughs> you might notice I said seniorosis instead of senioritis, because senioritis would technically be the inflammation of the seniors, whereas seniorosis is the flaking off of the seniors. <laughs> and that just feels right. <laughs> The other reason is because I can't, I can't trust the culmination of my academic career to a man who doesn't understand percentages. <laughs> if, so, if anyone ever tells you, on a scale of 1 to 10, this is an 11, tell them to get a better scale! <laughs> you chose those bounds! You did this to yourself! If you want to grade this as an 11, set your limits accordingly! I'm trying to take meaningful data, get your hyperbolic conversation out of here. Uh, do you guys want to know what the hardest major at BYU is? Yes. yes. Thank you. It's every engineering major. And I know that because every engineering student told me. I think the reason we have a, a bad rep as far as communication goes is because all we really know how to say is when our next due date is. <laughs> like, next time you, you see one of your engineer friends, ask them, hi, how are you? And count 
on two hands how long it takes them to bring up their next deadline. <laughs> My record is eight seconds. Eight of them. Uh, and like, like, that's all we do, that's all we say. I don't feel like the crab tree would change at all if we just replaced all the students with parrots and Star Wars t-shirts. <laughs> All we have to teach them how to say is, squawk, this model is killing me, this model is killing me. <laughs> and what, what drives me nuts about this is I have never heard a professional engineer complain about their job. Never, in my whole life. And uh, like, an engineer will spend all day on AutoCAD at work and then come home and get back on AutoCAD yeah. to, to continue doing their own personal stuff. Like it's, it's nuts to me, and I think I have it figured out. I have a theory. It's all an elaborate hazing process. <laughs> this four-year degree is really just rush week, just extended. It's to see if we're cool enough to be engineers. <laughs> In the quest to automate every job, we just automated our own first, and never told anyone. <laughs> So, uh, I didn't realize how lonely I was. <laughs> Someone up there just holding it back, like, I'm ready. I'm ready for this sad person's story. <laughs> I didn't realize how lonely I was until I was talking uh, in weirdly intimate ways about my projects. <laughs> like one time, I sincerely said the words while working on a carbon fiber bridge. Dang. That flange looks thick. T-H-I-C-C, <laughs> thick. And all my partners were like, oh, do you kiss your robotics project with that mouth? <laughs> yeah, man. The way, you treat, the way you treat your projects now is the way you'll treat your future capstone project. <laughs> That capstone project deserves your respect, even if it hasn't been assigned yet. If that wasn't weird enough for you. Uh, my mechatronics robot was named Plexi. Sexy Plexi. And I did spend all my time with it, and I braided its wires. My girlfriend referred to it as the other woman. Uh, and I would tuck her it in every night. And I was just so proud of, of all the steps she was taking. I, I, remember, I remember when she took her first steps, when she threw her first do ball, uh, when, when it developed fine motor skills. They weren't great motors, but they were fine. <laughs> and, after all of, and after all of that, I th uh, after all that I had been through with, with Plexi and, and her four other dads, I, <laughs> I thought, maybe I'm not ready to be a parent. Because as soon as we were done, we ripped her apart and scrapped it for pieces. The reason engineers don't get dates is because we're awkward and, and uncomfortable. The reason engineers shouldn't get dates is because we're monsters who would rip apart our own children if we thought we could make a better model. Alright, for, for my final jokes, I'm going to need some visual aid. Can we get that going, Parker? Yes. And we never told Tommy this, but that clicker does nothing. Uh, it's not hooked up to anything. Uh, we, we changed the system, it's an audio system. So there's certain, there's certain verbal cues that'll uh, tell it to switch slides. Uh, so this is, this, is actually, this is actually a sneak peek at my, my final thesis. Um, which I'll make if I ever do a, a grad study. Is that what those are called? A grad study? Can I do a grad study? Please? No. Um, so this is the kinematic rounding theorem. The, 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 uh, the commands are and uh, So as, as established, x is equal to distance. Which if we divide by time gives us speed. And if we divide that by time, that's acceleration. And if we multiply that by, by mass, we get force. This is, all, this is all just a kinematic review. Let's go faster. Uh, if, we, if we multiply that by distance, 
That's work. And if we divide that by time, we have power, okay? So we have... Uh, we, have, we have mass times distance squared over time to the third is equal to power. And according to Uncle Ben's theorem, with great power comes great responsibility. And they're therefore proportional. Now, if we cancel out the greats, that means that power is directly, res uh, directly proportional to responsibility. So that means that mass times distance squared over time to the third is directly proportional to responsibility. And as we know, distance squared is just area. And so the conclusion is that any increase in mass or area comes from responsibility. Therefore, responsibility makes you fat. <laughs> So this is where I'm going to tran this is where I'm going to transition from what TED talks were supposed to be to what TED talks are, and I'm going to tell a long rambling story. So I got about uh, a few years ago. I, I got a girlfriend, remarkably enough, uh, and we got together on September 3rd, 7 p.m. And we broke up by seven by September 4th, 7 a.m. But it's okay, because we got back together again on September 18th. But which led to us breaking, breaking up again on October 12th. I need a sadder signal. Can I have a sadder signal than... Yeah, I think I can program that in. Thanks, man. Uh, any sad sounds from the audience? Okay. Aww. But she took me back the next morning. Aww. And that lasted until the day before Halloween. And I took all this remarkably well for two reasons. One, I just did our couple's costume with sexy plexi instead. <laughs> and two, I'm good at math. You see, half a day, two weeks, uh, two and a half weeks, half a day, three weeks, you see the pattern, right? If you, if you, map, if you map us getting together as a positive x-intercept and us breaking up as a negative x-intercept, Badoo. That's the sign of 94 pi over x. <laughs> this is a true story, every word of it. As long as we're willing to accept this indeterminate area as the will we, won't we uh, thing that all relationships go through at the beginning, this maps extremely well. It's a high fidelity model. <laughs> Which means, aww, that we would get, according to the model, we would get back together on February 1st. Badoo. But we actually got to back together on February 3rd. <laughs> Who says you're not going to use math in real life? <laughs> and if you guys are as impressed as you should be, I made, I made sociology work. <laughs> <laughs> math really can reflect real life. And the best part about this was, according to the mathematical model, we weren't going to break up again until July 2nd. At least we wouldn't have, had she not found out about the mathematical model. <laughs> For all of you out there with a special someone, or have any chance of getting a special someone, here's some advice. If you get a girl worth cheating on the Katem lab for, you don't let her go. Except at predictably space intervals. Thank you everybody. This is our